I'm Ralph Sivenor. Welcome to the Builders of the Alarm Industry. Today is August 8, 2003. Special thanks to Honeywell Security Group, Ron Rothman, President of Ademco, for providing our camera and camera crew today, as well as to my right, Stanley Oppenheim, DGA President uh, Manhattan, for use of, of your facilities here. I'm delighted to introduce Ray Adams, uh, an old friend and icon, I would say, in the industry. And if I could ask Stanley Yu to ask some questions, please. Stanley? Thank you, sir. It is my pleasure to uh, be interviewing Ray, who is a person who has uh, made a significant contribution to the industry over the past years, both here in New York and uh, throughout the United States. Uh, Ray's history is long and varied, and he has many interesting things to, dis to share with us. Ray, as a beginning, uh, could you please share with us um, your background and the very beginning uh, and uh, entry into the industry? Thank you, gentlemen. If you have a few hours, I'll give you the uh, history. In July 1953, I was a special agent for the Counterintelligence Corps, U.S. Army, duty station North Queens in New York. A lead sheet came to me one day and it said, interview the following man about subject XYZ. That man's name was Sam Bagno. I went and interviewed him at a company called Allotronic and he startled me by saying, stop, don't move, now move, and the bell went off. And he explained that he had just invented and patented and, and uh, won a lawsuit with ADT on his new ultrasonic alarm system. We proceeded from there to lunch, which Sam was noted for having about nine-tenths of the day. And we got to talk one, one against the other. And uh, my question was, how do you market this product since I had never seen it before and certainly our office had never seen it before and none of our security work had ever seen it before, workers had never seen it before. And he said to me, well, in two weeks, we're going to start a sales force. And I said, in two weeks, I'm getting out of the Army. And I got out of the Army on July 23rd, 1953. And I joined his sales force on July 27th, 1953. And we introduced the ultrasonic alarm system throughout the country. My next major step in the alarm business was in 1958 when I left Walter Kitty, who was then the owner of the ultrasonic alarm, and joined a company in New York called Owl Protective and Imperial Products, and we marketed alarm products and also uh, local alarms. Who was the principal at, at OWL? Protected? Principal at OWL was a young man called Malcolm Goldstone, another legend in the business, if you ever knew him. Uh, he not only owned uh, those two companies, but his family also owned the OWL Protective Company, a central station in Philadelphia. I then assisted him in building a central station in New York, at that time called Central Office Alarm Company, and we uh, additionally through where, our where was that located? Ray? 3708 Greenpoint Avenue in Queens. Uh, additionally, at the same location, we built central stations, and I think we were successful in installing approximately 20 central stations for atomic weapons storage sites throughout the country, well, throughout the country and, and at least one other country. But many people don't realize it, but we had atomic weapons in New York City in the 19, early 19, late 1950s, early 1960s. We also had them on Long Island. Uh, in 1963, no, I'm sorry, 1966, I met a gentleman called Norman Rubin and his brother-in-law, Charles Weinstein, and they suggested that the, the three of us and, and two other partners open a central station in New York. At that point, we opened a company uh, called Mutual Central, located on Park Avenue in Manhattan, and proceeded into the business from zero accounts 
Three years later, we were successful enough to buy Central Office Alarm Company, Owl Protective in uh, Philadelphia, and run them all as one company in the, um, in the eastern or the northern corridor that we had between Philadelphia and New York. 1970, maybe 1970, we sold Philadelphia, New York, Westchester, and all the companies that we had at that time to Honeywell. And I became the regional manager for Honeywell and embarked on a purchasing campaign for them and purchased at least one or two more central stations in the Northeast. And the year on that, Ray, was when? The year was when? What year? 1970. 1972, I left Honeywell and joined with Norm Rubin again in his family-owned business of Supreme Burglar Alarm. We operated that for a couple of years. We then proceeded to open another central station in New York, naturally after our covenants ran out, named Varigard Central. The year after that, or two years after that, we opened a company in the jewelry area called Jewelers Protection Services. In the intervening time, we opened a company in uh, Florida called, uh, hmm, what Gibraltar? was it called? The, Gibraltar? Uh, not Gibraltar at that time. I think it was Southern Security. We subsequently took the name Gibraltar, operated those companies until 1983. Uh, Jewelers, uh, just to digress a moment, go backwards I should say a moment, Jewelers Protection Services was opened in 1975, but we operated all those companies until 1983 when we sold all of them to uh, security centers from London. 1985. 1983. In that range. SCUSA, I think it was. Mm -hmm. SCUSA. Security Centers USA. It would be called Security Centers USA, 1983. I became uh, president of that group, and in 1984, we bought Homes Protection in New York, Philadelphia, Chicago, and Los Angeles. We sold Chicago, we sold Pittsburgh, we sold LA to other companies and ran that group of companies here until 1987 approximately, um, 87, 88, and we, um, I left there went on to um, be a consultant for Ademco, Underwriters Laboratories, and uh, some other smaller companies. 19, I would say 90, I rejoined Holmes as president again. I'm the only person in the world who's ever president of Holmes twice. Left there in 91, joined up with Norm Rubin again, and we opened Mutual Central Alarm Service in Manhattan, and that brings us to date. Okay. Actually, Mutual, I believe, started somewhat before 91, though. It started oh, it started in 89. In 89. But I couldn't join them because I had some covenants. No, oh, actually, I was president of Holmes. Mm -hmm. At that time. At that time. And that brings us to present day, and you're still uh, present day, still at, at Mutual Central here. Yeah. Still at Mutual Central. Okay. Um, you mentioned a few names along the way, Ray. Uh, I think some of these names are names that I think that you would agree are individuals that might bear a few moments of time, even though this is your interview. Uh, certainly, um, Norm Rubin, who is uh, uh, who is your longtime partner in many enterprises who passed away a few years ago, was a person who played an important role in the industry here in New York and in the United States, and I'm sure that you want to perhaps spend a minute or two and 
describe him and uh, one or two anecdotes, if you wish, uh, that to try to capture his essence, because he was, in fact, a, just the important figure in the industry that he was. The day I met Mohan Rubin, my life changed. Um, he not only was a partner and the finest partner I've ever had, but he was a gentleman. He was honorable. I learned many things from him, um, most of which were in business, but certainly on a social level and on a family level. There was nobody finer that I can know or mention in, in the uh, alarm industry. Sam Bagno was the inventor of the false alarm, I call it, because his ultrasonic systems the, the first ones created more false alarms and havoc for police departments than any other device ever devised mm -hmm. by man. Uh, however, he had a genius and uh, his products are still in use. I also knew Frank Ebert, who was one of the fathers of the alarm industry in a central station in a company called Newark District Telegraph. Um, and um, Harold Gray. Harold Gray was the, um, one of the owners of Pacific Fire Alarm in San Francisco. Uh, and among other things, he was one of the pilots of a P-38, I believe, that shot down uh, Tojo in the South Pacific, if, if any of you are old enough to remember World War II. Yamamoto. Uh, Yamamoto. This was shot corrected. Yeah. Yamamoto. Yamamoto. Shot down. Not Yamamoto. Tojo. Tojo Not was the Tojo. other general. And of course, the, um, the most famous person of all is here was Stanley. <laughs> and if you, don't, okay. if, if you don't believe me, I will tell just you later. ask him. <laughs> and I will tell you later. <laughs> okay, let's get back on track here. Okay, um, back on track. Uh, insofar as your, the early years in the industry, certainly um, when you began, the, the nature of the technology um, of the installations was dramatically different. Um, uh, than it is today. Could uh, give a description of what a central station in 19, uh, in the early 1970s uh, looked like and what kind of technologies uh, one would find if one walked into a operating central station at that time. In 1966, if you wanted to open a central station, you called Potter, you ordered one McCullough rack, one direct wire rack, one battery charger, a set of batteries, I sent him a check for $6,500 and you were in business. All right, share with us who Potter was, Ray, if you would. Potter, Jim, uh, Jim Flotron was the manager of a company called Potter in St. Louis. Potter was an old central station company and an old family in the manufacturing business. And when you wanted to open a central station, you just called Jim and said, send me a central station in a box. The, the technology was a little higher than what's required to turn on the lights in this room. And the, um, the shared system was a McCullough loop, which was uh, equivalent to a party line service using a, a telegraph key and a telegraph receiver at the other end to decode your messages. And the direct wire systems were simply measuring electric current through a wire and dropping out of some relays at the, uh, at the central station end. Um, that, and when I entered the business, I was an absolute technical wizard because I understood both. Uh, we used to be able to sit down and draw the circuitry for a McCullough circuit in about 10 minutes, including all the receiving equipment. The way the McCullough worked was um, each person had a party line cable delivered by the phone company and series in the nearest telephone company office. The subscribers were connected along the line in series with a, an open and ground circuit. In the event of an alarm, you would get first an open and then an overlap ground and at the uh, central station, a little relay would drop out and go beep, 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 beep. The operator read the code and said 312 came in four times. That means there's a fire at, and he'd look up 312. And he had to look it all up because there was nowhere else to get it. 
No computers. No computer. Um, and the burglars didn't know how to defeat a McCullough, so we didn't have many defeats. But to, to defeat a McCullough, you simply had to put a bridge on the phone line at the subscriber and chop them off, and you never know the difference. Direct wire was a little more sophisticated in that we measured the current on a uh, telephone line supplied by the phone company, and we measured it to within thousandths of an amp. A normal current was 20, alarm current was 30, dead short circuit or ground was 50, a day current was, uh, was 20, night current was 10 milliamps this is, and the subscriber simply went home at night flipped the switch from night to day, put his protection in the circuit, got two rings from the central station, which was supplied by an AC current, uh, usually 60 cycle current, no, actually, usually 20 cycle current, telephone ringing current, superimposed on the line to a ringer in the, in the subscriber's premises, and two rings meant go home, four rings meant stay there, you didn't do something right. And that was it. If a, if a burglar broke in after that, two things would happen. The line would go open first, then it would go shorted, and a, an operator in the central station would be able to read open and short. That's a burglary. Do something about it. That's changed slightly in that now I uh, gaze in amazement at our central station, which costs about, um, let's see, I think it's now instead of 6000 or 6500 it's about 300,000 in equipment to open a central station. Stanley would verify that, yes? Surely correct. You have to be a computer wizard, computer operator, and able to program systems. So I now hire people to do that because I can't do it anymore. The right. I'm going to turn to no, no, go ahead. Um, you, just on that same subject, uh, you um, were mentioning that the interconnection between the premise and the central station was over lines leased from uh, the local telephone company, which of course in those days there was only one telephone company. It was a AT&T, a, a, a operating company of uh, AT&T. In your case, it was would be New York Telephone Company. Um, but memory tells me that that they did not always lease telephone lines to uh, independent companies such as yourself, and that was uh, a, o a obstacle uh, for many years in uh, local alarm companies becoming central station alarm companies. Um, could you share with us uh, your knowledge of, uh, uh, of that whole issue? In the New York area up until 1957, it was not possible for an independent company to rent a phone line from the phone company for the uh, purposes of signaling alarms. The only people they would rent to were, I should know, were um, ADT, AFA, Holmes. Uh, yes, Holmes, or all, all three were owned by the same company at one time, mm -hmm. and uh, Central Station Signals, a fire alarm company on 23rd Street, which is now Wells Fargo or, or whoever owns them today. Uh, in 1957, Malcolm Goldstone, whom we mentioned earlier, sued the phone company for access to their lines and won the case. And at that time, it then became possible for all of the independent companies to open central stations. I think uh, Malcolm um, and I opened his first central station in 1958 or 59 in Long Island City, and that, of course, became Honeywell. Um, the technology changed. The, um, the telephone lines were a great source of false alarms because a, a, um, a six thousandth of an amp, six thousandth of an amp ground on a direct wire would cause an alarm at night. And uh, we spent many days tracking down alarm signals caused by the phone company. The modern technology using digital dialers, uh, pulse net with derived channel radio has 
eliminated to a major extent, a major, major extent, false alarms from the interconnecting um, signal path, which is what, that's one of the best things that's happened in the technology is we've been able to eliminate false alarms caused by extraneous elements. Ray, um, prior to Malcolm Goldstone uh, opening up uh, his uh, Central Office Alarm Company, uh, working with you and his that lawsuit, um, the company one company dominated for a hundred years the central station alarm business, burger alarm business in New York, in a, in a, u a unique and special way that is hard for would be hard for people viewing this to understand. That company, of course, being the Holmes Electric Protective Company, could uh, you share with our viewers the what it was like to be in the alarm business prior to? to that lawsuit when a subscriber, a local alarm subscriber wanted a central office connection and the, the dominance of that one particular company? Prior to the 1957 decree, if you, if you were a local alarm company, meaning you didn't have a central office, but you installed local alarms that, that rang bells at the premises, uh, you couldn't be in the alarm business. You could not be in the alarm business. Central station business. In, this, in, the, in the, yeah, that's right, in the central station alarm business. A, the first breakthrough came where central station signals, the company we mentioned earlier, made available their central station to local alarm companies and a, they would sell you a BAPA, burglar alarm, BAPA? Police burglar, alarm, burglar alarm, police alarm. Burglar alarm, police alarm unit, which was no more than a, 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 mi a mi minor McCullough unit, which was tripped by the local alarm and through their McCullough network signaled the central station. They used to provide that service of something like $5 a month. It was the first time any local alarm company could provide central station service. So those are truly the third party monitoring companies. That is correct. That's right. That's, and that dates back to when, Ray? Uh, in the 1950s. Or certainly, if not then, the early 60s. Correct. But it was the first third party monitoring company. I know well because in the 60s. that company used to pay uh, us as salesmen $10 for making that connection. and. Uh, Ten dollars aboard dinner at a, a good restaurant in those days. But Ray, Ray, why don't you touch upon, however, the dominance of oh, yeah. the you Holmes? You want to know company. about Holmes? Yes. Holmes was started. 1858. In yeah, <laughs> Stanley knows all the history. He was there. 1858, <laughs> by Mr. Holmes, in Boston, using lines, which he and his company installed over rooftops. Since there was no insulated wire, he went to a corset manufacturer and had him braid cotton over copper and provided the first insulated cable that they used. They also put tar on top so that it'd be waterproof. And they ran, th ran their own cables over rooftops. And they, there are pictures someplace yes. showing hundreds and hundreds of cables. Ray, tell it, about the his, dominance of the company here in oh New York. Okay, well, I'm mean, giving okay. you the, the true background. Okay. You'll okay. learn something. Okay. Uh, his partner in that venture was a man named Alexander Graham Bell. And Mr. Bell owned, t I think, 25% of the company, which he felt there was no a reason there would be no market for that, so he sold it back to Holmes for about three dollars or something. But Holmes in New York, they moved to New York eventually and became the totally dominant company in the business. They had at one time 23 central stations throughout New York City, each one equipped with uh, central station equipment, guards. Um, they were complete central stations, and the reason that there were 23 of them is that it was too costly and too much line resistance 
in the telephone wires that would have to r run to a one central place in the city. So they had 23 dispatch stations. Actually, they had more than 23 dispatch stations because they had some dispatch stations that weren't central stations. If you were a bank in New York or a jeweler in New York, you simply called Holmes. There was no other company but Holmes. And I only wish that it was like that today. Ray, I'd actually like to make a note on that. Can I see your pen? Mm -hmm. Yes, of course. Mm -hmm. Okay. Keep going. We want the pen. Keep talking. Yeah, if you were a bank, mm -hmm. you went to Holmes and said, I would like to have an alarm system. And then, when they got ready, they would install one for you. And um, I would say this, that the, the prices, in my recollection, were very, very, very unreasonable. But if you wanted the service, that was the service. And if Stanley and I could only do that today. We came too late. Yes, we um, were able to compete on a very, very, very fair basis with them starting in 1966 and we're very happy with the uh, results. So basi basically, Ray, that till 1966, uh, effectively, the Holmes Electric Protective Company dominated, uh, actually controlled and had virtually 100% of the Central Station burglar alarm business in New York. New York City, yes. In New York City. Outside of New York City, ADT installed burglar alarms. In New York City, they did not. AFA, Automatic Fire Alarm, a sister company, only installed fire alarm in New York City. I think I uh, have um, a, an antidote. When I was at Holmes, I opened a president's hotline for people who were complaining because uh, people said they couldn't get, well, when you're the only game in town, uh, you get a little um, egotistical. And that, that even prevailed when I was there. But one evening at six o'clock, a customer called and we had just sent out a, um, an increase letter and he said is this the president I said yes he said what are you doing there at six o'clock I said well I'm here and he said well I have a complaint I'm the um, I won't use the name of the, co the company I'm the financial officer for this uh, gentleman and you protect his home and I think that this increase is, is simply terrible. And I said, well, why do you think it's terrible? He said, well, it's gonna be $400. And I said, well, $400 for the increase? Uh, the increase was, uh, was only 10%, and you have a private home alarm, which would end the house. I looked up the record quickly, and the house was uh, four stories high, and it was a brownstone in Manhattan. And he said, and I said, so it would be $40, but we can ameliorate that. He said, no, no, you don't understand. We pay $4,000 a month for your service for our house, and your increase is $400 per month. So um, I th thought for about one, one hundredth of a second and I said you send back the bill with four thousand dollars and you put on it that you're not going to get an increase ever and put my name on it and we'll take care of it and a gentleman I think is still a customer and he still pays only four thousand dollars a month. Ray, the, um, your beginnings in the industry go back to a time where there was a strong independent local alarm business here in New York. Uh, small companies uh, covering in very generally a sm specific geographic area in the city installing local alarms, that is alarms not connected to a central station. At that time they were all battery operated alarms. Some of them actually traced their roots to the night patrol business. 
Um, it was a colorful group of individuals and a colorful business at that time. And that actual business doesn't quite exist the way it was uh, at that time. If you could share with us your experience with those people, some stories that you might want to share, and what the alarm industry looked like in New York um, in those early years of your career. Sure, let me tell you about the first alarm system I ever heard of. The first alarm system that I've heard of was installed by cavemen and they used to put loose stones and dry leaves outside their caves to alert them if anybody was sneaking up on them. And then we advanced technically from there to the local alarm business in New York, which was an entirely bad... It was a big jump. <laughs> <laughs> about three years. <laughs> three years. Um, the, uh, the local alarm uh, local alarm industry in New York was divided up, as Stanley said, amongst a bunch of, a group of colorful characters. It had its beginnings not in the patrol business, Stanley, but in the protection business. I was being nice, Ray. Oh, where people <laughs> used to come in and say, we'll be back every month for $3 and your windows won't get broken. And uh, it progressed from that to where for $3 a month, we used to come by once a night and check the doors, which was patrol business, three bucks a month. And then of course you had to send another man to collect the $3 and he's the one that went. Um, quick antidote for uh, the patrol business. In my, uh, once in our um, company, many years ago, a customer called and was very irate because after we patrolled last night, some bum came and relieved himself in the doorway. And he wanted us to come back and clean up. We said, no, 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 you'll notice there's a ticket in the door with a time on it, 12 o'clock, whatever it was. I, we said, the ticket is ours and the mess is yours. Mm -hmm. In any event, the local alarm business and the entire alarm business at that time was a strictly non-electronic business. Straight wire did everything. We made special, for protecting glass, you used tin foil which I believe is three ten thousandths of an inch in thickness and three eighths of an inch wide, stretched and pasted to the glass in such a manner that breaking of any glass will break the circuit through the tin foil. It's actually lead foil. Um, windows were protected by contact switches and tin foil or by a system of wooden dowel screens, either half round dowel or full round dowel with hard drawn wire in ridges in the wood itself so that breaking through the wood would break the wires, causing a, an open in the circuit and an alarm to go off and stay off until the batteries wore out in the circuit. There was nothing like a photoelectric cell or a shock sensor or a motion detector available. The first leap forward technically was the photoelectric cell, uh, where you shine a light uh, at a receiver and if a person walks through the beam, they break it and alarm results. The, um, I'm trying to think of some other very, very uh, technical advantages, advances at that time. Where, where if it was necessary to protect walls, the way you did that is to put up, um, fla not flake board, but press board on the walls Masonry. and foil the entire wall on six inch centers and then put another cover of press board over it and a person breaking through would break the foil causing an alarm through the circuit. 
you really wanted to do a full job, you not only foil the walls, you foil the, foil the ceilings and the floors. Great, 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 great time waster. The uh, systems, the installations were labor intensive and not, not very, um, not very difficult to circumvent or even accidentally circumvent with a couple of grounds in the circuit. We progressed from there to where now a typical alarm company can detect you because you're moving with microwaves or ultrasonics or, or passive infrareds. They can detect you if you're warm with infrareds. They can detect you if you're making noise through vibration detectors or audio detectors. They can detect you if you're burning a vault door by the smoke detector inside the vault or heat detector inside the vault. And just about anything that you're doing can be now detected by um, electronic means. The electronic devices have advanced to the point where they're pretty much false alarm free if the installers are doing their job. The systems have become less labor intensive, but more technical, so that your installer has to be part technician to do his job right or to program the job at the, uh, at the uh, conclusion. The central station personnel. A typical operator in a central station in the 1960s took about 30 minutes to train. You said the meter says night, it's night. If it says short, it's a short, that's an alarm, you do something. If it says open, that's an alarm, you do something else. If it changes from night to day, followed by three beeps and a dash, that's the customer opening. If it goes from day to night, that's the customer closing. And then you had to teach him how to read the codes on the McCullough circuit, and that was the end of the training. Now, probably six or more months to train a person in computer usage in order to be an operator in a central station. To be a manager takes up years. Ray, you, you touched upon the uh, colorful personalities, and I'd like you, to, if you could, just to share more about the various media, you know, the early meetings of the the New York Electric Alarm Association, these colorful individuals, what their companies were like, and you know the, what the local, the so-called local alarm industry was like in those, uh, those days, um, the, early, the early days uh, of your entry into the industry. Well, the, um, the companies pretty much um, were operated by families. Uh, one company with three brothers. Uh, they could have been the Marx Brothers for all I know, but they were three brothers. They were just as funny as the Marx Brothers. All of us, a lot of us here know who they were. We won't mention it or their names. But one brother would instruct the crew at what to do, and he'd leave, and then the other brother would come back and countermand what the first one said, and the third one would come in and change everything so that nothing got done. was a, a woman, <coughs> Marion Davis, I think her name was. She was an oh, hmm? Do you remember the name? Marian? No, go ahead. Who owned a company called Star Burglar Arm in New York. And she had one mechanic to work for. That's all. Just one mechanic. The thing about the local alarm business was we were very possessive. And God help you should you come and install an alarm on our block? Because we couldn't permit that. Could not permit anybody else to install an alarm. Norm Rubin used to say to me, this is our block. They can't come here. Um, the charges might be interesting. We used to charge at that time, I think the maximum the minimum price for a full installation certified by UL was $50. 
and the, the minimum charge that we would make on a monthly basis was five dollars. A non-certified job was thirty dollars installation and three dollars a month. And then you went around and collected your three dollars. As I said with the patrol earlier, you collected it by hand. That did two things. It made sure you collected it and it was cash. As a matter of fact, during those periods, we used to, uh, a friend of mine and I would sell, and we had sold by the method of wince selling. On our larger installations, we would wince sell. Anybody know what that means? No. Nope. Simple. Uh, Mr. Jones, this alarm system is going to cost $300, but he didn't wince. So then you would say, and in addition, it will be $30 and no wince per opening. Still no wince. And then, of course, there's a the connection charge. And if he winced at that point, we'd say, however, we'll waive the connection charge and only charge you the $400 or $500. <laughs> if he winced in the first place, we stopped. We also sold on the basis of how busy we were, and we probably still sell that way today. But the busier we were, the more we charged. If we weren't the more idle that we were, the less we charged. The um, people I think that you would uh, uh, enjoy have enjoyed our labor negotiations at that time. All local alarm companies in the 50s were, or let's say most local alarm companies, were members of Local 3 IBEW electrical workers. And we used to negotiate our contracts en masse. There was a committee for the alarm companies and then there was the committee of workers at this point. And if this were the room, we would like the table to be a little wider so that the other side couldn't jump over and kill us so fast. But most of the time was spent arguing between ourselves as to what the next step was going to be. You know, do we give them a nickel an hour this year or not, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And it was quite an experience, a good experience for later on when we negotiated directly with unions ourselves. We had very colorful people. What was the name? Duty Mendick? Duty Mendick, I knew him. Duty Mendick, the man who ruined the good central station business. He was the first person on this planet to issue certificates to non-UL approved companies so that they could be in competition with us. He was a third party monitoring station that would issue a certificate, a central station certificate for an alarm company who wasn't certified. That has made a big difference in the industry. Big difference. What other things can I tell you, Stanley? You tell us a great deal, we're sure, but uh, the limitations of time are at work. Yes. Um, it's an opportunity uh, to just to comment uh, on, uh, you had a lifetime in this industry and years to, many years to come, we hope, but um, just to wrap up with a moment perhaps and just share with us, you know, how you, did you enjoy uh, this uh, truly illustrious and career, long career that you've had up to this point? and, uh, and uh, what it's meant to you. I have enjoyed every minute that I've been in the alarm industry. I've made installations from, uh, or have installations from the Aleutian Islands to Panama and places in between, like Fargo, North Dakota. Um, I wouldn't, I have never spent an uninteresting day in it. 
I've been in it now since 1953, as you noted before. Um, I still haven't made enough money to retire. M my son is in the business, and I would hope for him as, as much success as I've had. But success uh, has come as a result of a lot of good fortune. If, if your competitor in our business is doing the job he should be, it's very difficult to compete with him, very difficult. So my advice would be if you're going to be in this business, do what your salesman says you're going to do. Do it right and do it often and you should be very, very happy. Ray, on that note, we thank you very much. Oh, I thank Again, you. And this is an interview with Raymond Adams. Uh, it is the August 8th, 2003. My name is Stanley Oppenheim, and uh, we thank you all for listening.